Hello everybody, this is Jesse here. With, we're back at you with uh, another reading of the Grand Design Exposed. And in today's video, we're going to be reading Chapter 7, which is called English History, American Heritage. English History, American Heritage. This is kind of where the history is going to start to get interesting now. You know... We're going to start to see glimpses of things that we may not have heard before. Um, so, to some of you people, the, you know, these things that we are going to be covering now is, is probably going to come at you as some kind of, as, as, as a sort of a shock which, I mean, that's perfectly okay, because if, you know, you're of somebody that hasn't heard these things before, it would come as a shock, because you weren't taught this, um, you know, and that's perfectly understandable. The Bible says, uh, the time of this ignorance God winked at, you know, so, um, obviously ignorance is, uh, is a big thing and um, God does wink at the time of ignorance but once truth is revealed to them he commands everywhere everyone everywhere to repent you know so so that's why it's very important now that when it when when I put the book sources and the references that are quoted within each of these chapters it's really important to see if you can get a hold of these um, resources and these type of things so you can look these things up for yourselves because a lot of this book here um, as I stated when we first started this book is kinda like a history book it's like an untold history book so and now we're getting into some parts of history that might be pretty much for the most part well untold okay so let's go ahead and get started chapter 7 English history American heritage a princess married then rejected with a brief reflection on history we can get a glimpse of how events starting 40 years before the Jesuit order was founded was to lead to later intrigues and conspiracies that constantly kept all of Europe in a state of bloody and violent uprisings. Efforts spurred on by Rome and her Jesuits with seething hatred and vengeance instigated to repulse the advancement of Protestantism. It was in the year 1501 that the youngest daughter of King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain was married at age 15 to Prince Arthur the brother of Henry VIII of England. At this very same time, Christopher Columbus, who was seeking permission from the King and Queen of Spain for his fourth and last voyage to the New World, was being postponed because of the wedding. However, the marriage of Catherine of Aragon, as she was known, to Prince Arthur was short, for he died within the year. It not being normally lawful for a man to marry his brother's widow, yet with some string pulling and with the reason given that it would unify the kingdoms of England and Spain, a papal dispensation was granted. Catherine remarried Henry VIII of England in 1509, it being Henry's first wife. Catherine had six children by Henry, of which only one, named Mary, survived. Mary later, in 1553, to 1558 became Queen of England and tried to restore Roman Catholicism by burning over 300 Protestants as heretics she earned the name quote unquote Bloody Mary so if we back up a little bit isn't it funny that The King of England needed a papal 
dispensation granted unto them in order for the wife to be remarried. Okay. So here we start to see the struggle between England and the Vatican. But when, when you really dive deep, it is the Vatican that does have sole control. And England is kind of like one of those rebellious children that just doesn't want to uh, obey at times and you know it's 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 quite the unique history between the Vatican and England um, and um, it's it's uh, it's definitely well worth a uh, side study to look these things up King Henry VIII wanted a male heir, which Catherine was not providing. Meanwhile, as a pretense, Henry began to feel some scruples as to the validity of his marriage to his brother's widow. He applied to Pope Clement VII for an, for an annulment. Catherine then appealed to her nephew, German Emperor Charles V, for help. Through the influence of Emperor Charles V, the Pope denied Henry an annulment. Henry, determined to be free of the marriage, obtained his own annulment, declaring his marriage with Catherine invalid in 1533 without the Pope's consent. This led to Henry VIII's separation from Rome and excommunication in rebellion against the authority of the Pope. Parliament passed the Act of Supremacy Law, making the king the supreme head of the Church of England in place of the Pope. Parliament also enacted statutes suppressing the monasteries in England and confiscating all their property. Okay, so, again, to go through this process of divorce and, and annulment, or not only that, but any... Um, anything to accomplish anything had to, you know, all orders and all ideas must have been accepted by Rome. And so here is this rebellious king who, um, who rebelled against Rome's authority. And out of that rebellion, there was this act of supremacy law that was put in place, which made the king of England the supreme head of the church of England. And this was a contestual battle, not just in the 1500s, but I mean, it expanded beyond that, um, you know. with the aspects of, well, okay, you know, the king of the England is the head of the Church of England, but who owns the crown? Okay, who is it that owns the crown? Is it the king or is it the pope? You know, so there's been some scruples and there's some interesting dialogue, you know, with this history. Um, and, again, you know, I, I can't get into all, all of this history in this video, but it does, uh, there is a lot of, um, aftermath of secular Protestantism that basically stemmed from what happened here between Henry VIII. And what I mean by secular Protestantism is Protestantism in a way that's not really Christian. Okay, it, it, it doesn't really have Christian principles to it. Or godly um, godly principles to it. In a way that it's not um, it's all it's it's still basically man centered. The politics and these type of things. Even though there are principles attached to it, it's more of a secular you know, it's 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 more of a secular, humanistic type of pro of 
protest that Henry VIII raged against the papacy. And really, a lot of the freedoms and these types of things stem from this event here. Um, so... King Henry VIII was an unscrupulous and tyrannical monarch. In all, he had six wives. Two he had beheaded. Yet, the greatest scandal of England was the notoriously immoral lives of the clergy, especially the monks, where two-thirds were frauds, gluttons, worldly, sensual, living in concubinage, and peddlers of indulgences and relics. What's the difference today? The lives of nuns, being not much better, were also scandalously immoral. They were a hindrance to the royal authority, and the excessive gold and silver sent to Rome to replenish the papal treasury was a severe drain that weakened the resources of Henry's realm. Henry cleaned it up, stopped the flow of wealth to Rome, and confiscated the Pope's properties. In essence, he conducted a much-needed reform. So, I mean, just, just because King Henry VIII did all these things did not make King Henry VIII a God-fearing Christian man. Okay, um, he was still a very tyrannical king. He only had this rebellious notion towards the Pope because of, uh, um, the Pope's refusal to give him an, an annulment. And so, because of this rebellion, we have a lot of these laws that garner freedom from the Papal State. And this next paragraph explains this. Religion did not motivate Henry. Instead, he was obsessed with strengthening his royal throne. In fact, Henry hated the doctrines of Luther and detested Protestants. He never gave up the Mass or the dogmas of the Roman faith, but made them law for the Church of England. However, even though Henry brought down upon his head and his English kingdom the hatred and anathemas of Rome, he also threw wide open the door, even though it had been long in the making, for the English Reformation. A deadly contest. What Henry began in England soon developed into a deadly contest that became spearheaded by zealous Jesuits urging on raging Roman Catholics who vigorously opposed the English government and denied the right of a Protestant even to live. That Jesuit contempt for what Protestants hold most precious, the circulation of the scriptures among the people, free inquiry and private judgment never died even until today it spanned the sea right into the English colonies of the new world and quietly planted its diseased roots in the seat of the fledgling American government biding its time in spite of Henry VIII's fanatical despotism which only reflected his Roman Catholic heritage he paved the way for the freedom we Americans enjoy today and take so much for granted as Rome now lurks behind the scenes, poised to steal it all away. It must be seen by anyone who has given the slightest thought and study into this subject that the intense struggle here is not just about religion, but something vastly more important. Religion is only a tool, a vehicle, the perfect means to reach an end. A system to become rich and powerful, absolute, all religion is false, man-made. To worship the God of creation, in truth, is not religion, but truth, indeed, where only love, peace, and joy reigns. Both Pope and King alike were conceived to rule and regulate the masses, positions of power and luxury that only corrupts the mind and character. The noble aristocrat looked upon all who were below his stat status as less than human. They were his slaves, their lives worth nothing other than to work his fields, cook his food, 
dig his gold, make his clothes, dress him, be there for every beck and call. For an aristocrat to get his hands dirty from menial labor was a, di was a disgrace. Columbus could write in his log how sweet and gentle a people the natives of the New World were, and then bring back a boatload chained as slaves. That's an aristocrat's mentality. They have no conscience, no feeling, no compassion for anyone they judge below them. And their arrogant, haughty, conceited, self-centered minds, how could they even imagine inferiors to be able to think independently? To have a voice in government and run their own lives? It just wasn't natural. Stirred to a fanatical fear and desperation in seeing a social change where nobles would lose all control in the name of religion, they rallied to the call of Ignatius and joined his Jesuit soldiers. The Jesuit Institution The Jesuits took to the field as they added to their numbers. They were everywhere. Each was assigned to the task which his talents of his disposition had best adapted. To one, the instruction of children. To another, a career of letters or science. Some planted their missionary stations among Peruvian gold mines. Or in the marts of African slave trade, among the islands of the Indian Ocean. In the cities of Japan and China. In the recesses of Canadian forests. They had the most important chairs in the universities. They had control of the schools of Italy, France, Austria, and Spain. And they became the most elegant, learned, and fashionable preachers in all Catholic countries. They grew to be an awesome institution, an organization with 20,000 eyes open upon every cabinet, every palace, and every private family in Catholic Europe and 20,000 arms extended around the necks of every sovereign and all their subjects assigned to the care of royal consciences, whereby unseen their whispered word would guide the destiny of nations. They adapted their doctrines to the taste of the rich and powerful, and the elegance and arrogance and worldliness of their dignitaries. Jesuit La Chasse traveled in a coach with six horses and was an elegant and most polished man of the world. He had to be in order to be selected by King Louis the Fourteenth of France to be his confidential and influential confessor. And no matter how low his station or elevated his position in the backwoods of America or King's courts of Europe, superiors had to make long and detailed reports of every act of significance and were required to send them to the Jesuit general in Rome. Those in Italy, once a month, elsewhere in Europe, every four months, and those overseas, annually. Source materials to guide the world back to Rome. So, remember, in the previous chapter we discussed how a lot of these nobles and rulers and these types of things um, had to basically select a confessor. And the ruler and these confess, you know, and, and the rulers and nobles and these kings, queens, and prince and princes they would confess their secrets to these confessors and these confessors were Jesuit priests and upon these confessions the reports were taken and they were sent back to Rome to the Jesuit superior, superior general you know and so this is basically how information is gathered and sent back. Now do you understand the phrase all roads lead to Rome? This is the reason why. Moving on. Rome's atrocities. <clears throat> 
Volumes have been written about the horrendous accounts of Protestant blood spilled during the 150 years following the founding of the Jesuit order. Many counter, well, Protestants killed too. Yes, and in answer to that, any man worth being a man, when someone comes into his home to rape and butcher his wife and dash his children to pieces, certainly will fight and kill too, if need be, to save those he loves. Okay, so, he's, he's under, I, I, I mean, so, don't be mistaken here, you know, Protestants had their shortcomings too, they killed people as well, you know, they had marching orders from their kings and prelates and stuff like that, as a matter of fact, Calvin ordered a certain individual, I don't know how many, maybe it was just one, to be burnt at the stake. Okay? So, just because, you know, people like myself parade the reformers, don't get me wrong, they had their shortcomings, some of them quite big. And they had some vastly different doctrines. But the one thing that was very unanimous, again, was the identity of the Antichrist and the importance of getting scripture into the hands of the common people. Okay, that's what I support. I don't condone a lot of the political actions and punishments. You know, I mean, the commandments are simple. Thou shalt not kill. Okay? And we are to love our enemies. Now, obviously, human nature does kick in. And I can totally understand this, you know, this phrase here. Protestants killed too. Yes, and in answer to that, any man worth being a man when someone comes into his own to rape and butcher his wife and dash his children to pieces certainly will fight and kill too if need be to save those he loves okay I, you know human nature kicks in sometimes and I would have to safely assume that in that kind of a condition human nature would kick in now does that mean that that person is lost because human nature kicked in and he defended his family? No. You know, it, it, I'm pretty sure there's valid reasons for doing it. I wasn't there. I'm not there. I can't, you know, say yay or nay. I can't tell you what I would do in a similar circumstance. Why? Because I haven't experienced that before. So... Moving on. To read an account is quite different. Let's see, here we go, exactly what I just said. To read an account is quite different than having to live through it. To literally witness a terrible scene and to see those you hold dear bearing mangled and slaughtered before your eyes has to make an image so vivid, never able to be erased, and yet some of the most horrible scenes ever to take place were during that time period. Far too many and much too savage to try to describe. It must take an awful cold heart and willful blindness not to see the overwhelming atrocities that Rome and her cohorts have inflicted upon the human beings of this world. Not even to mention the wholesale genocide of the South American Inca and other nations who were systematically worked to death digging for silver and gold or other natives on islands in the West Indies and Caribbean, where today there is no trace of aboriginals, the very place where Columbus landed, planted his cross, and ceremoniously dedicated the new world to the Pope. Where in those same islands the population is 90% Catholic, and now you know why. And in some of those islands, its people are the poorest in the world. You're gonna, that, there, that's a common trend for Catholic-dominant countries. 
you have to ask yourself why. No, we won't get into any of that. Instead, we will just touch on six of the most dramatic events. Those your own reference books will confirm. Just six, among others too numerous. And history really wants to forget anyhow. Number one, Queen Mary. When Henry VIII of England died, he left one son, Edward, and two daughters. <coughs> Mary and Elizabeth. Edward VI was ten years old when he came to the throne, but because of sickness reigned only six years, favoring Protestantism, and then died. Now, I mean, it's, uh... You might have to question... You might have to throw into the question of, of why he just died suddenly. I mean, was it because of a sickness, or what was the cause of that sickness? Okay, there is no proof of any foul play, but he did die young, and it was a sickness that killed him. So, I'm not going to get into it, but there are some questionable things apply to that history because what because he was a favor he, he 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 favored the protestants he was a favor of protestantism and obviously that is the number one enemy of catholicism you know so to have to have a young individual at 10 years old as king only reigns six years comes down with a sickness and then dies while while looking at his background favoring Protestantism and he also had the founding of the founding of the Jesuit order and their workings in England, you have to question it. You have to question it. Not saying for sure, but to question it, I believe is wise to do. So Mary took over. Mary, who had become a very embittered lady because of the harsh treatment by her father, Henry VIII, towards her and her mother, reigned next with a vengeance, determined to reverse what her father had done religiously and bring England back under the Roman Catholic Church. She took the first step that would ensure powerful backing by marrying, in 1554, Philip of Spain, the son of her cousin, Emperor Charles V the same emperor that her mother appealed to for help to save her marriage. This union, along with re-establishing Roman Catholicism, brought great consternation and distress among the people of England. To crush all opposition, she began a reign of terror with over 300 Protestants being executed. She too died early of sickness at the age of 42 having reigned only five years, from 1553 to 1558. Okay, you know, so again, there's this, this is from the same family, and Queen Mary died of a sickness and only reigned for five years. Okay, so this could have just been a simple hereditary thing, you know, with um, King Edward and Queen Mary and these types of things, but... Again, it doesn't hurt to question some of these events. <clears throat> but that five years fixed forever in the minds of the English people out of fear and dread, if for nothing else, to hate and be wary of everything that was Roman Catholic. The Protestant Church of England, also named Anglican after angels, the Germanic tribe from which England derived its name, and also the name Episcopal became permanently the official religion of England but not but not without an intense cat contest and uh, you know there's a uh, later on in this book we're gonna get into the aspect of the royal declaration and um, it's a very, it's a testament 
of how <laughs> anti-Roman Catholic England and its politics and policies has had become. And a lot of it can stem from the reign of Queen Mary. Okay. So number two, St. Bartholomew Massacre. Huguenot Protestants in France united together and became a show of real strength, causing great concern for 22-year-old King Charles IX and his dominant mother, Catherine de Medici, who actually was the real power behind the throne. Upon Catherine's suggestion, a plan was put forth to rid the Protestant Huguenots once and for all. A royal wet wedding was arranged in Paris, France, between Margaret of Valois, the sister of Charles IX, and Henry of Bourbon, a Protestant nobleman. A deceptive gesture to bring religious unity and peace to France. Knowing that the royal event would bring many thousands of Protestants to Paris, plans were carefully laid for the date August 24th, 1572. At midnight and at the ringing of the church bells, to become the time and signal to begin a massacre of all Protestants in the city. The St. Bartholomew Massacre, as it is known in history, began in Paris, but then quickly spread to other provinces all over France, continuing for over a week. Without gory details, it was reported that close to 100,000 Protestants were butchered unmercifully during those few days. The river Seine literally ran red with Protestant blood and could not carry away all the headless, mutilated, and putrefying corpses. It was so f it was so full. Upon Pope Gregory the Thirteenth hearing the news, the same Pope who had Bavarian mathematician Jesuit Clavius to devise the Gregorian calendar, the one we use today, by the way, he rejoiced ordered a jubilee and celebration and had a medal struck in commemoration of the glorious Catholic achievement. And of course you hear all of these popes today you know apologizing and asking forgiveness and these types of things but ask yourself this question have they ever recanted their statements of this celebration because of what happened in St. Bartholomew? So are they really truly sorry? <laughs> or is this more of a repentance for is this merely a repentance basically to gain favor? or to gain sympathy worldly sympathy number three the Spanish Armada in England fourteen years before the Bartholomew massacre Elizabeth the younger half-sister of Mary took the throne as Queen with flint-like determination, she set a course to rule England that favored Protestantism. Pope Pius V ruled, quote, We declare the aforesaid Elizabeth to be a heretic and a better of heretics. And we declare her and her supporters to have incurred the sentence of excommunication. We declare her to be deprived of her pretended claim to the aforesaid kingdom and of all lordship, dignity, and privilege whatsoever. Also, we declare that the loads, subjects, and peoples of said kingdom, and all others who have sworn allegiance to her, are perpetually absolved from any oath of fidelity and obedience. Consequently, we absolve them and we deprive the same Elizabeth of her pretended claim to the kingdom. And we command and forbid her lords, subjects, and peoples to obey her. We shall bind those who do the contrary with similar sentence of excommunication. 
So haughty are the claims these degenerate men to. So, wow, I butchered that one. So haughty are the claims of these degenerate men to believe in their minds to be the Pontifex Maximus, God's representative on earth. As such, they believe they have unlimited power to depose every monarch, hand over every country to foreign invasion, deprive everyone of his possessions without legal process, and one, anyone offering help to one deposed, even basic human kindness, would be excommunicated. This peril stared Elizabeth straight in the face, as behind the scenes the popes and his Jesuits encouraged civil disobedience. However, the popes, and as incredible as it seems, in Elizabeth's 45-year reign, she saw nine popes come and go. They all fully underestimated the patriotism of the English people and the English oak heart of their queen. A mighty fleet was prepared with numerous war gunships and large transports, 131 ships in all, carrying over 30,000 men, two-thirds who were soldiers. The Spanish quote-unquote invincible armada, it was called, as it boasted its superior weapons and awesome numbers of strength. They were on a deadly mission, never doubting for an instant anything but success. With breeze-filled white sails glistening in the sunlight that put in motion that day on July 22, 1588, the spectacular and proud armada glided out of Spanish Corona Harbor. Destination, England. Mission, Invasion to bring the English under Spanish control and full submission to the Holy Roman Catholic Church. To teach this upstart usurper, illegitimate bastard, heretic of a queen, and all her heretic subjects with her a lesson. Ambitious mission, indeed. The English had advanced knowledge of the coming armada and so kept a close watch for it with preparations made to give warning signals at the first sighting. Then the reality was upon them as all England became alive with the news that the mighty fleet was approaching, spotted by a patrol 100 miles off the coast. The English Navy sprung into action as it put out to sea to engage the enemy. Catholic Spain, the most powerful European nation of the time, against small Protestant England. The scope of what was at stake here was tremendous. The common man fighting for human rights in protest of the aristocrat forcing him to be his slave. <clears throat> As the Spanish Armada advanced up the English Channel, it formed a crescent battle formation with most of their gunships on either end of the crescent, and the transports in the center. The English fleet met them with 60 gunships that were smaller but more maneuverable, with heavier and longer range cannons and seamen who were excellent gunners. To break up the Spanish formation, the English, under cover of darkness, sent in several fire ships filled with explosives which sent the Spanish fleet into a panic. From then on, the battle was in the English's favor. The Spanish were outmaneuvered, outgunned, and outclassed, driven on the run into the North Sea. Here the limping Spanish fleet made a fatal decision to return home by going north of Scotland and around the west side of the British Highlands in Ireland. Several storms battered the already damaged and leaking remaining ships to pieces. The whole operation became a Spanish disaster, with nearly half of the ships lost and three quarters of the men dead. <clears throat> Number 4. The Gunpowder Plot Eight years before the attempted Armada invasion, Jesuits were seditiously active plotting the overthrow of the English government. 
by using different disguises, aliases, and secret codes to illegally slip in and out of England. Jesuit Robert Parson in 1580 had led and then later organized a mission to bring other Jesuits into England to engage in a work of subversion. When the invasion failed, these masters of intrigue turned to another bizarre scheme, known in your encyclopedia under the subject the Gunpowder Plot. Thirteen Catholic noblemen and five Jesuits formed a conspiracy devising a plan to explode 36 barrels of gunpowder in the cellar of the House of Lords and kill King James I and members of Commons as they assembled for the opening of Parliament on November the 5th, 1605. Their plan was to blow up the Parliament building and out of the chaos incite the people into a full insurrection. It's always about bringing people back into subjection to the Vatican by any means necessary, whether advertly or covertly. From a nearby building, an underground tunnel had been dug to the Parliament building where they gained access and put in place 36 barrels of gunpowder. But before the date it was to be detonated, the explosives were discovered, leading to the arrest of all those involved. The noblemen, after becoming aware that the plot was known, united together, choosing to resist arrest by fighting. Five were killed in the ensuing battle, with the remaining eight being brought to trial, convicted and executed. Of the five Jesuits involved, two escaped, one died in prison, and two were convicted and executed. These failures only became minor setbacks to the Jesuits in their mechanical robot persistence to subdue all for Rome. But to the English government and people, each episode was a harsh and stark reality of the fanatical enemy among them and the vigilant precautions needed to protect their freedoms from Popish rule. And then when you look at the world today, and when you look at England today, you have to ask yourself, what ha whatever happened to the vigilant, the vigilant precautions? You don't see vigilant precautions, because everything is already subject to Popish rule via the Jesuit order. Actually, there is a very unique movie that is based off of this, and the movie is called V for Vendetta. Now, in the movie V for Vendetta, Guy Fox was actually successful in blowing up Parliament. Okay, obviously, this is t th this is. Uh, I mean, it's a fictional movie, it's not based off the real events, but <clears throat> you can flash forward to modern times, and the context of the story is very, very similar. Okay, so... I just thought I'd throw that one out there. Number five, The Thirty Years' War. The Thirty Years' War... From 1618 to 1648 was a series of conflicts that became the last great struggle of religious wars in Europe. It was fought, fought almost exclusively on German soil, where a hundred years earlier Martin Luther had taken his Protestant stand, but before the war ended it involved most of the nations of Europe. The underlying cause of the war was the deep-seated hostility between the German Protestants and German Catholics. With the Jesuits and Cardinal Richelieu, who was the real ruler of France, fanning the fires to accomplish their ends. When the war was over, it had totally wiped out the German economy, leaving behind a wasteland where one half, some historians say even two thirds, of the population were dead. Germany was left in a pitiful condition, and those who survived saw nothing but ruin ruin wherever they looked. 
Whole cities, villages, and farms had disappeared, and what remained was damaged or nearly destroyed. It took 200 years for Germany to recover from the efforts or from the effects of the Thirty Years' War. Many thousands of weary souls fled Europe, especially Germany, fleeing Roman Catholic religious tyranny, seeking refuge both in England and then in America. Number six, the Irish Massacre. The sixth and last event to be considered is the Barbarous Irish Massacre with its October 23, 1641 launching date, the date that also celebrates the Catholic Feast of Ignatius Loyola, founder of the Jesuits. The appalling accounts given in the Book of Martyrs, a historical compilation of the sufferings and deaths of Christian martyrs throughout history by John Fox, who also lived and experienced those terrible times himself personally, is a record of the most inhumane and grisly acts of man's inhumanity to man that you could ever read. Again, the plot is instigated by the Jesuits, priests, and friars, who excite the ignorant Irish Catholic people to a frenzy to commit the most unheard of cruelties. In faraway France, Cardinal Richelieu, the French minister, had promised the conspirators a considerable supply of men and money. In one stroke, Catholics rose up against their peaceful and unsuspecting Protestant neighbors and spared no age, no sex, nor condition led on and declared by their fanatical priestly leaders that no Protestant should be suffered to live any longer among them, adding that it was no more sin to kill a Protestant than to kill a dog, and that the relieving or protecting them was a crime of the most unpardonable nature. The onslaught raged on, and when it had ran its course, 150,000 Protestants lay mutilated, butchered, dead. No wonder establishment historians have trouble recording this type of Roman Catholic history. Nowhere in Protestantism is there recorded a fraction of this kind of wanton murder as described in just these few instances, but for the unbiased researcher, history seeks of the butchery of Romanism where whole cities and populations were unmercifully wiped out, just because they worshipped God in a manner that was different from Roman Catholicism. Nonconformists fleeing Roman terrorism is European history, written with the blood of those who could not escape. It's true. And we're coming to the same scenarios today prophecy will be fulfilled <clears throat> American English colonies if the reader will notice the dates you can see we have now entered into a time period that can be related to events we are familiar with and events corresponding to our early American history for example all Protestants are familiar with the English-speaking King James Version of the Bible. It was published in 1611, just six years after the Gunpowder Plot of 1605. Jamestown, in 1607, became the first permanent English settlement in America, a village in East Virginia. The town in southeast Massachusetts, named Plymouth, was founded by the Pilgrims in 1620. Roger Williams, the founder of Rhode Island, founded in 1636 the Colony of Providence. In 1608, Captain John Smith first explored the area that is now known as Maryland. In 1632, George Calvert, Lord Baltimore, was granted the Maryland Territory where he founded his colony. As the English began to colonize the New World, they brought their Protestant faith and beliefs with them. They were leaving behind the European stronghold that for centuries had been ruled under Roman Catholic despotism to start a new life 
They did not need to read history or be taught by parents or grandparents to understand Roman terror. It was raw, fresh in their minds from personal experiences. Okay, so let me read the first sentence here again. As the English began to colonize the New World, they brought their what? Protestant faith and beliefs with them. They were leaving behind the European stronghold that for centuries had been ruled under Roman Catholic despotism to start a new life. The English beginning to colonize a new world and the English colonies, the American English colonies, was not a bad thing for the colonial period. Okay, because those that were coming into colonial America were coming into colonial America escaping the despotism and the terrorism of the Roman Catholic Church and the persecutions. They were fleeing the persecutions to seek freedom so that they can worship God according to the dictates of their conscience. And they had it in the New World. They did not need a declaration of independence. They did not need a freedom of religion. They already had freedom. <clears throat> they did not need to read history or be taught by parents or grandparents to understand Roman terror. It was raw, fresh in their minds from personal experiences. During this exact time, the Thirty Years' War was ravaging Europe, and the 1641 Irish Massacre was soon to come. It was these terrifying experiences that in indelibly molded Protestant minds and convictions against Romanism. But Romanism just would not die. That system of religion and the monarchies that supported it served only too well the ruling class of power and control over the common people. When you have power and control over the common people, you don't have middle class. You have the ruling elite, and you have the paupers. That's it. And the paupers seek refuge to the, you know, they seek the refuge of the state which is the ruling elite. You have rich and poor. You don't have a middle class. You don't have people thinking or working independently. Yet the English government was quite different in that it had a parliament, and through it progress was made for the voice of the people to be heard. The struggle became relentless, relentlessly terrible, but out of it produced the predominant heritage of the American colonies. The next 100 years, from the time that James I took the English throne in 1603 until after the quote-unquote glorious revolution and the invitation of Parliament asking Protestant William III, Prince of Orange, and his wife Mary to accept the English crown jointly in 1688 till 1702 was an era of great struggle to rid England of the shackles of Rome. Through those years, even though the Anglican Church was the official church of England, by parliamentary law, it suffered severe setbacks from kings coming to the throne who were sympathetic to Roman Catholicism. But each setback only made the people, through its parliamentary government, more determined to reduce the power of the monarchy and give the government to the people ruled under Protestant principles. This was not accomplished overnight, but with many blunders through the years, it progressively found its way, and those Protestant principles of human rights became the foundation of our own American Republic form of government. And that American Republic form of government is at the heart of the Glorious Revolution and is at the heart of the colonial period. It has nothing to do with 1776. This is where the history is really going to start getting interesting, folks. This is, this is going to deal with the blanket that 
that covered a huge block of time within this time frame between 1600 and 1776. Because all you hear about is the Revolutionary War, you know, the supposed, you know, chains that were uh, being held on the feet of those, you know, the, the chains of King George of England that were being held on the feet of those people in the, co you know, in the colonies and these types of things. Was that all really true? Or was there something more sinister at play? Because again, as the last couple pages here stated, and it is highly documented, those ever fleeing persecution already had their religious freedom. So what was the need for religious freedom in America? Why was there a need for a revolutionary war and a constitution that enabled religious freedom who was the what was the the um what was who was the intended target to apply this religious freedom to what religious group was banned primarily in the colonial period in colonial America, besides a Maryland colony, and what religion was forbidden to be practiced in public areas, even in England. It was Roman Catholicism, and it was Roman Catholics that are at the heart of the American Revolution to get, grant freedom of religion for Roman Catholicism. And so, like I stated in videos past regarding the second beast in Revelation. The second beast, yes, has two horns like a lamb and speaks as a dragon. It has two horns like a lamb. It doesn't mean it is the lamb. Scripture does say that Satan does come as an angel of light, doesn't he? And ain't no marvel that his ministers are transformed into ministers of righteousness, right? So sure, you can have principles put into a constitution that may be Protestant in nature. But at the very same time, the voice of that beast is the same voice of the dragon. Because again, no marvel for Satan is able to transform himself into an angel of light. Likewise, his ministers transforms, transformed into ministers of righteousness. You look at that concept, and then you look at the second beast out of the earth. And then you'll see what's at play here. Sure, a lot of the laws and these types of things seem nice. You know, they, they seem good. You know, it's 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 a government of the people, by the people, for the people. But in all actuality, that was the carrot. And the carrot dangling in front of us, really, what does it do? Is it spurs up patriotism. It spurs up love for your country. Don't we belong to a country and a kingdom that's not of this world? So on this earth, aren't we just pilgrims passing through? So even though some of these principles might sound great, might sound good, are we supposed to hold on to it like some treasure? Or is our treasure supposed to be stored in heaven? These are some questions I really want you to ponder, especially when we look at these latest chapters these next few chapters because we're going to get into the very very unique history so I want to thank you for listening I want to thank you for watching truth be told truth be known stay safe God bless and we will see you next time bye bye